Hello, welcome to this video, and on this video I'm going to be ranking from 10 to 1 the greatest jazz musicians that ever lived of all time. Okay, the criteria that I will be judging on them will be primarily innovation and creativity. In other words, the things they brought to music that were unique, right? Which I think is something that jazz did in the 20th century, really informing and developing all the other music forms that then came in from all the popular music forms to all the esoteric forms jazz touched the lot it's the most important music form of the 20th century and so the 10 greatest musicians will be the 10 most important musicians of the 20th century and all my choices are for the 21st century of course but also technical brilliance charisma, songwriting, compositional ability, skill, popularity, all those things I have taken into account when I came up with this list. I have taken all the parameters and then spent three months fine tuning this list so I could come up with the ultimate objective list of the 10 greatest jazz musicians. Yeah, I feel bad now because that bit wasn't true. That was a lie, right? That was a lie, I'm so sorry. I did just make up a big fib. I didn't. I didn't actually do that. What I did was, is I got like um, a pen and paper, and I went, "Who's the most important?" I wrote that down and said, "Who's the second most important?" And then I wrote that down. And when I got to ten, I'd finished, and I looked at it and I went, "Well, that to me, in terms of my subject subjective perspective of the music I like and what I know about jazz history." Surely that's right because that's the list that came to mind. So what you're really seeing is this. It's not an objective list. It's just a bloke on YouTube telling you who he thinks are the 10 most important jazz musicians. That's all it is. Don't get wound up about it. It's only my opinion, right? I never normally say this. I always make out like it's the list because if, if you didn't think it was the list, you wouldn't come here and then get all angry because your favorite jazz musician is not on it. That's what this is all about. We all know really, don't we? We all know really. So let's start, shall we? So, um, I really wanted to come at this in an organic jazz way. So um, I've written the list. This is the list I've got up with. I've got it down there in front of me. And I'm going to tell you as I go through this list um, how I, what I think about it, what my sort of reaction is to these musicians. Because most of these musicians I have talked about so much on this channel. So if you want to know more, you see what that will do, that will that will funnel you into subscribing because there's over 500 videos. So if you want to know about whoever I'm talking about, just go and Google Andy Edwards and that person's name on, on YouTube and you'll find a video about it. So I'm going to kick off right now. At number 10, I have Thelonious Monk. Now Thelonious Monk, for me, stands alone in the history of jazz. So many jazz musicians came in and they pioneered in a way that um, created a new style of music, right? Now, I believe Thelonious Monk did that as well. And I believe that any jazz musician worth their salt could get up and play a tune in a monk-like way. He created his own sound world. And that's not because he wasn't an innovator like a Charlie Parker or a Louis Armstrong. He was an innovator for sure in that way. In fact, if you go back to 1938, 39, and you listen to the early Minton's recordings, which is where, you know, swing turned into bebop, Thelonious Monkey's there. He's there at the, in, the, in the crux of the most creative period of jazz after the sort of development of jazz, you know, in the uh, 1910s, 1920s, you know, specifically the 1920s. So this, this, he's a part of that, but um, Thelonious Monk has his own approach. And um, he, he, there's so much stuff he's done on the instrument, which is incredible. One is he has a certain relationship to the blues, which is unique, it's his, it's his relationship. But a lot of his stuff is blues based but it's blues based in a certain way. He has a real adherence to swing and groove. He's always swinging really hard. And in that respect, I think he has an influence on a lot of the sort of rock and roll and rock music that's, that's to come. Um, in terms of the way he plays, he approaches the instrument in a sort of compositional way, taking a lot from Duke Ellington's approach to piano playing which I would say is like a composer's approach. But he also has an interest, which really almost seems to go back to 
African music. So he's playing the, the piano almost like a drum. He's, he's thinking of the percussive and rhythmical aspects of the instrument, which we then see in pianists like Cecil Taylor later on. And um, we, we, it's also pulling in microtonic. He, he, he's, 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 he's creating clusters of notes because he wants to get in between the notes. And that's what Thelonious Monk seems to do. He always wants to get in between everything. Um, he's an eccentric. Thelonious Monk's an eccentric. He had eccentric ways, eccentric behaviours. He loved his hats. He loved, if he was into the music, he'd stop playing and start dancing on stage. He had his own unique way of, of doing stuff. Um, he, I think he was quite quiet and shy. He wasn't a self, um, you know, promoter. So um, even though he emerged in the late 40s, and, and it's got people like, you know, Blue Note Records creating albums, which is called The Genius of Thelonious Monk. So he's got that there. But um, because he had principles, and because his friend got done for drugs in a car or something like this, and he would not snitch on him or say it, he ends up losing his, his ability to perform for a number of years. And that takes him out of the mix. So we, we don't really see um, Thelonious Monk getting the credit that he should have got until the late 50s and into the 60s. Um, my favourite album by Thelonious Monk is possibly the album he made with John Coltrane. John Coltrane's almost like the antithesis of Thelonious Monk, but they have a way of balancing each other in the same way that Coltrane balanced Miles, but it's like a diff completely different thing. And I feel in 1957, when Coltrane joins Monk's band, that's the lightning point, right? That's the lightning point for Coltrane. It comes from Monk. And I don't know whether it's because Monk had this individuality. That is what Rep Thelonious Monk represents to me. He re represents these jazz musicians that cannot be categorised. They seem to work, you know, live in their own world. Like Sun Ra is one of those. Don Ellis is one of those. These musicians that have carved out their own world and they don't relate to some style of music. They've, they, any musician that does that, and so many other musicians have done that to some extent on this list, but to me... Thelonious Monk is the great individual. So that's who I've got at number 10. Right, it's taken me seven minutes to do that. It's going to be a long list, right? Number nine, I have the great Coleman Hawkins. Right, why is Coleman Hawkins on this list? Because he is the, the, the first important saxophone player. Um, the lead instrument in jazz um, up until the 1930s was the cornet or the trumpet. You know, you have that New Orleans front line, which was trombone, clarinet, and then trumpet or cornet. And jazz came out of that school. Now there was a whole bunch of saxophone players playing in the um, uh, 1920s. And a lot of those were coming out of dance bands where the saxophones resided, you know. And of course, the, the saxophone, which is a relatively uh, new instrument, only invented in the late 19th century by, you know, Adolf Sax. Is that his name? Adolf Sax? Yeah, I'm making this all up as I go along. Um, but yeah, so it's a relatively new instrument and people are trying to find the language for the saxophone. And what you have is through musicians like L Lorenzo Tio, who, who, who was a musician that came from, a, um, I think, a Mexican family. And he brought a certain aspect of clarinet technique into jazz. And we see that emerging through Sidney Bechet. And Sidney Bechet is probably the first real virtuoso of jazz. And that clarinet technique then that goes into soprano sax. So Bechet is there. We, know, we, we always say Colman Hawks is the father of saxophone player, but then we have Sidney Bechet playing a soprano sax way before. But that element then gets taken on by people playing baritone tax, center tax, tenor sax, alto sax. It comes through the big bands, which, are, which originate out of the dance bands in the 1920s, right? The, the, the most important guy in terms of that was Fletcher Henderson. And uh, Fletcher Henderson had a bad band which contained a very young Coleman Hawkins. And Coleman Hawkins had a vision for saxophone. Coleman Hawkins had a virtuosity and harmonic knowledge that predates bebop. Okay. Um, in 1939, he records a version of Body and Soul uh, where he really doesn't play the head. He just used the harmonic form to create, which is almost like a classical piece of music. Uh, Body and Soul is one of the great leaps forward in jazz history. All right, later he does a solo um, saxophone piece related to Body and Soul called Picasso. These recordings are very, very important. Coleman Hawkins had a, a sound that could go from sort of 
beautiful, you know, almost like classical fruity sound he had to a raspy blues sound. Um, and to um, modern ears, he's very listenable in terms of going back to musicians that really emerged in the 1920s. So that's who I have. The father of saxophone playing is Coleman Hawkins. And at number eight, I have the great Fletcher Henderson. As I said, Fletcher Henderson had a big band, right? And he emerges. Now, if you think about this, Fletcher Henderson had a band that I think for a short time Louis Armstrong joined, right? So um, Louis joined Fletcher's band. He was there. He, he was pioneering a way of arranging um, what were basically dance group, cocktail dance groups that were playing in the sort of the nightclubs at that time. He was the guy that brought jazz in and arranged it for the big band, creating a certain sound, all right? Um, all the way through jazz's history, and I'm really trying to tackle this on this channel, and it's a really hard thing to, dif to talk about, because as soon as you start to talk about um, jazz, you start to talk about race, and you come up against a racism that existed when jazz was being created, a horrendous racism. But we also come up, in my opinion, with another ideology which makes it difficult to make certain objective statements about race, right? So um, there's this idea um, that jazz was created by the white men. It was created by literally Paul Whiteman. <laughs> I didn't mean to say it like that, but it's true. You know, if this, is, this is something that was grabbed from a community and it was presented... Um, with white musicians. Um, in the 30s, the uh, marketability of c and commerciality moves from um, the African-American you know, community in America to white audience, right? And we see the emergence of swing. So we have, the, we have New Orleans style, and then we have an urbanized Chicago style, and then the Chicago style. Through Fletcher Henderson and his arrangements, then gets presented to the public and starts to sell millions of records. And that would be um, Glenn Miller, Artie Shaw, and artistically the greatest of them all, of the white big band um, um, groups in the 30s would be Benny Goodman. Um, and Benny Goodman pulled in Fletcher Henderson and used his arrangements that had been created in the 1920s to really set the scene of swing music in the 1930s. So Fletcher Henderson is unbelievably important in the development of big band music, um, large scale, arranged, composed, orchestral music for jazz, basically. He is absolutely, uh, the, he's, he's the father of that as far as I'm concerned. He's the main guy. And um, it's an awful thing that his input has definitely been diminished due to a racism at the time, without a doubt. Um, and um, if you go back and you just look at the musicians that came through, like Coleman Hawkins, musicians like this that were able to, within that creative environment, really change the face of jazz. Um, he uh, carried on, we, we, he worked into the 1950s, I think he died in the late 1950s. And in the early 50s, he took on another musician called Herman Blunt, also known as Sun Ra. And Sun Ra then take, took that sort of um, approach to uh, a big band and he mixes with his own sort of Afrocentric science fiction fantasy world and creates the Sun Ra thing, which basically then informs P-Funk, Bootsy Collins, which then informs hip hop. And if you look at that, all that has its roots back to Fletcher Henderson in the 1920s. It's absolutely incredible. So that's who I've got at number eight is Fletcher Henderson, right? At number seven, I have the great Cam Count Basie out of Kansas City. You know, in the early 30s, Kansas City became a very important town. And in there, you had a guy that was playing big band music, but he had an idea about the rhythm, the swing of it. And he creates this incredible rhythm section. Absolutely incredible. Freddie Green on guitar. He's got Joe Jones on um, drums. It, it, they are playing like walking bass lines. They are, um, uh, you know, Joe Jones is moving the swing from the sort of snare drum over to the hi-hat. 
you've got that choppy guitar sound. What we have in Count Bass is bad, which is the swingiest. Everyone says this, the swingiest, grooviest of all the um, big bands. What we have here is swing, the blues, and rhythm. And those really are going to be the bedrocks on which rhythm and blues and rock and roll and gospel and then rock music and funk music are built. If you go back to some of the early recordings of the Count Basie group in the 1930s, it sounds pretty much like rock and roll. That sound is there. The only thing that's missing is the country element. Now, of course, if we go back to a lot of these musicians who were working on in the 1920s, like Louis Armstrong and all these guys, they were turning up on country sessions as well as blues sessions and jazz sessions. These things hold hand. And Count Be Basie represents a certain sound, a certain groove, a certain swing, which is so important to the history of music. His stuff is absolutely beautiful as well. And um, with the uh, success of all the sort of white uh, big bands in the 30s, um, there are two big bands that emerge and really become successful in the 30s. I guess you know the other one, a guy's going to be on this list as well. Uh, but Count Basie is possibly the second most important big band in history. All right, so um, let's move on because <laughs> I will be talking a little bit more about the count in a bit. So at number six, I have, I think, the much maligned and ignored Ornette Coleman. Okay, so Ornette Coleman emerges in the 1950s and there's a couple of things about him that that's, is difficult for the audience, right? He has a different approach to bebop. He's coming out of bebop and he's also coming out of rhythm and blues as well. Um, and he has to approach to those. And what he starts to realise is that when you're improvising, this idea of adhering to the chord changes. So the chord changes are like the god of jazz. You have to, they can't be changed, right? But when you're improvising, you're dealing with a whole bunch of wider parameters. You've got tone, you've got rhythm, you've got the, um, the, the direction, the motion of what you're playing. And sometimes when you change what you're doing to adhere to the chord changes, you could be dishonest to the motion of what you're playing. Right now, you say, yeah, but if you just go off and play anything, um, it's just out of tune, it doesn't work. Well, not necessarily so. If you've worked on improvisation, you start to realise that um, what makes a note right is not its harmonic relation to the harmonic foundation, right? You know, it's not that. It's to do with when you play it, how you play it, why you play it, right? Those all count, right? If you're phrasing correctly and you know what you're doing, and most importantly, you play with enough confidence, you can sell the notes. Now, when you're improvising, right, what you're doing is telling a story. And stories usually go like this. They go like, um, I got up this morning, I got out of my bed. I went downstairs, made myself some breakfast, and I left the house. Now, that's where you start. People start to, at home, you start, and then you go out the door or you go out the harmonic frame and you have to you can't just sit in your house all day it's too boring you're going to get out so you're walking down the road and then at the end of the road what looked like a ufo landed now at this point you'll go whoa i didn't expect that right what's going to happen now the ufo took me off and it told me the secrets of jazz improvisation that had been brought to us via saturn and the great saint of jazz sun ra you see, I've got Sun Ra back in. He was right all along, I thought. I thought it had come from New Orleans, but not. Sun Ra was right, it came from Saturn. And it's not about the notes. It's not about the harmonic framework. That's not what makes improvisation. It's about what's in here. And he plopped me down. He plopped me down in my street and I went back to bed, you know, with a new knowledge of what improvisation was really about. Now that story has to go out. It has to go out and ask a question. Now. To do that harmonically, you've got to leave the framework. You've got to leave the rhythmic framework. You've got to leave the timbre framework. You've got to do the unexpected. The UFO has to land. And the great genius, I think, that realised this was Ornette Coleman. And when he changes jazz, it splits down, jazz down the middle. The whole middle, there's a whole bunch of musicians that get it. 
People like John Lewis from the Modern Jazz Quartet. People like Ellis Mercedes Winton's dad, who was like fascinated with what Olnet was doing, was playing with him. They, you know, what's this new way of playing? Now, um, of course, now we live in a world where jazz has become just this elite place where, you know, people with rich parents, you know, and some musical talent could indulge themselves for three years at jazz college and learn to play through giant steps, right? The kudos that those, you know, that elite gets by being able to jump through the hoops of this very difficult thing and play the changes, right? We don't want Ornette Colbrand saying, no, just forget that, just do what you want. I can remember reading um, a biography of John Coltrane and, and it said how John Coltrane was trying to free music. These musicians in the late 50s were trying to free music to us so we didn't have to worry about this stuff, so we could just play and express ourselves. That's what they were trying to do. They were trying to, to free the human soul from the binds of this world. This is what they were trying to do. And Coltrane did it by taking the very structure of jazz, taking the 251, and trying to bust it open. And for him, he was a little bit like Sisyphus trying to push that rock up the hill. And when he got to the t hill, who was dancing around like a court jester? Ornette Coleman. Because he'd just taken the pathway straight up. And that, those two approaches are the things that freed music. And when I was a young guy and I came across the Ornette Coleman and I was dumbfounded by him because it didn't seem so weird. But the freedom, the, the freedom and playfulness, and if you listen to his melodies, they're very playful, right? Ornette Coleman is not full of existential postmodern angst. He's, he's full of a joy of life. Coltrane, his Coltrane's got an angst to his, his music. Ornette hasn't. It, it's about play. It's about being like a child. It's about being childlike. You know, Ornette really saw himself in an entirely subjective point. He really thought that the universe was all around him and he was always at the centre of the universe, which of course you are. And it's those type of ideas that informed what Ornette Coleman's done. Now, I know I need to do a big video on Ornette Coleman and I know this is turning up turning into a video about Ornette Coleman. And I'm gonna move on, and even now, so I think, is he just a bit too low on my list? But we do have geniuses on this. So what we've got is Ornette Coleman. Now I've got to say, before I move on, I think his legacy has been ignored for the very reasons I've just described. The kudos of, of, of being able to play the changes has become very important to jazz musicians. And because Ornette is against that, Ornette's legacy has, has somehow been pushed aside. That's what I feel. And I think it would be great to put Ornette back into the uh, music colleges and for the lecturers to explain what he was trying to do and let musicians take that path if they want. And does that mean they don't learn to play through the changes? Yes, it does. It's not about learning to play through the changes and ignore it. That is what your conservative world will say, oh, no, Ornette Coleman's fine, you know, it's great what he did, but you have to play, learn to play the changes first. Why? Why was he doing it? He was doing it to free us. Now what happens if you don't learn to play the changes? You stop doing those bebop lines. You stop playing cliches. Because music education, jazz education, is basically telling you how to play cliches. Or when it's not, he's, out, he's teaching you how to play you. Let's move on to number five. At number five, I have the aforementioned John Coltrane, right? For me, there's four musicians that have basically um, created me as not just a musician, but as a person. Four. One is Frank Zappa, one is John McLaughlin, one is Miles Davis, and one is Joe, John Coltrane. John Coltrane is really, really important to me. He's a slow starter. He's the same age as Miles Davis, and, in, and by 1946-47, Miles is playing in Coltrane's band, uh, sorry, in, in uh, Charlie Parker's band, and Coltrane is on that scene, he's there. But he, he, he is not bristling with the genius yet. I have recordings with him playing with, um, I think, Dizzy Gillespie's big band, right in the mid to late 40s. Um, so... He's a slow burner, and throughout the 1950s, he's plagued with drug problems, he, he's searching for something, he's working, and anyone who uh, tells you about Coltrane will tell you that he was practicing continually. You know, he would practice like 10, 12, 13 hours a day. He was searching, he was trying to push music, and as, as he goes towards this, and he realizes that he, um, 
needs to stop being a drug addict and he goes in 1957 through a spiritual experience um, which is then documented on the later Love Supreme and then he sees music as a spiritual goal. Now I think this is his great legacy to music because he really brings a sort of spiritual, spiritual um, aspect to jazz but he links it with a sort of the tortured existential angst of a, a, a modern soul in a modern world. Those two things are both in Coltrane's. We we hear the the um, uh, the attempt to move upwards, to ascend upwards, but we also hear the pain that is caused in that ascent. Coltrane is always climbing, like I said, um, and that you. Is such an important sound, right? It's in Hendrix sound when you listen to the Machine Gun. It's in John McLaughlin sound when you listen to the Mavishn Orchestra. Coltrane comes along and he moves an entire generation. He becomes the most important musician to anyone who's improvising in terms of the 1970s. Um, Ornette's influence doesn't kick in, in in the 1980s. And it's in fusion musicians like Schofield and Pat Metheny that are far more playful. But if you're playing in the 70s, you have this earnest angst where you were aiming at the horizon. This all comes from Coltrane. Now, yes, he wrote Giant Steps, and Giant Steps has become the big testing ground for jazz musicians. And to be a jazz musician, you have to be able to play through Giant Steps. But people forget what he was trying to do. He was trying to play a 2-5-1 progression in three different keys simultaneously. The law of three the esoteric triangle, right? And the law of three is a complete system which encapsul encapsulates the whole world of the thesis and the antithesis of those two, three things being uh, brought together in synthesis. We see it in, um, in all art, in all music, and we see it in the 251, but by sending it into these three dimensions, and, and playing it with the velocity which Coltrane is playing, where he's playing such a florid number of notes that he's not just he's not just he's not just giving you a specific note on that chord. He's giving you slabs of harmony, big washes of sound that roll over you in three keys at once, and suddenly we break through the harmonic framework. And later on, when he's making albums like Interstellar Space, where he's duetting with Rashid Ali, and it's just drums and saxophone, and he's unfettered by, from a harmonic grounding, and he's making an album about the space that it exists between the stars, right? There's that viewpoint. There's him aiming out, right? He is still, if you listen to it, he is pushing through that giant steps triangle, you know, trying to bring the triangle together, the law of three, which will just bust open, right? This is all very esoteric and spiritual, and I think that gets forgotten. Even though people can hear it in the sound of Coltrane, they can hear it in the, the, the sound of a love supreme, they know that that's there, and that's influenced a generation. So that's who I have number five, is John Coltrane. Now, Con John Coltrane came to um, preeminence in this next guy's group. You know, this is one of the many things that this guy did, and this guy's above Coltrane, but again, he's almost like the antithesis of John Coltrane, and that is, of course, the Dark Prince, Miles Davis. <coughs> Miles Davis emerged, as I said, with Charlie Parker's group, and then back in 46, 47, I think 47. He then goes on to take bebop and in a direction out of bebop, and he makes a, a album called Birth of the Cool. Miles is there basically laying the groundworks for um, uh, West Coast jazz, cool jazz. Um, and a lot of those players like Jerry Mulligan that were gonna be big stars in that, are on that album. He wasn't working in a, in a vacuum. He was working with the great Gil Evans who had taken you know, the sort of compositional arrangement approach of Duke Ellington and just pushed it into a post-bebop world. There's a lot going on there. But again, like Coltrane, by the time Miles gets into the 1950s, he is plagued with drug abuse. He's 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 working as a pimp. You know, um, at some point he gets so ill that it affects his vocal cords, creating that. You know, he's got no vocal cords basically. That's why he had to talk like that. And that's the, that's the Miles thing. If you uh, go on the YouTube, you can find an interview of Miles in the early 50s with his real voice. It's quite disturbing. 
as the 50s go on, he has an approach to trumpet playing which I think marries the masculine with the feminine. Right, the, this is this dialectic I really believe is always there in music and you can get a lot out of music by trying to ask yourself, where's the dialectic, where's the two opposing things in this that are being brought together in the triangle to create the synthesis at the top? And with Miles, you've got the tough guy, the, the, you've got the pimp street guy who is driving around this Ferrari, he's a boxer and all that tough stuff, but you also have this very feminine um, hurt, wounded sound in his trumpet, it's mournful, it's lonely. And that sound in the early 50s could play anything. Right? He could have taken um, the Birdie song, right? Which is a horrible, cheesy song here, here in the UK. I don't know if you know it elsewhere in the world, but you know. Ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. Imagine Moss takes it down a little bit and plays it with the, a muted trumpet, and suddenly the Birdie song is transformed into great art. He didn't do it with a Birdie song, but if we take something like Someday My Prince Will Come, which is this nice little. You know, someday my prince will come from uh, Snow White. Miles plays that, and suddenly anyone listening to it that is in the is in this lonely place, full of postmodern existential angst. There's so much postmodern existential angst in any music past about the 1940s, 50s, 60s. That's what it's all about. And Miles personifies that. There's a darkness. There. There's a loneliness there. And so he starts to sell tons of records. He can play anything and that sound will just transform it into something beautiful. Right, very few musicians have that. Jeff Beck had it. Um, I think Louis Armstrong had it. Um, Miles had it. You know, there's, there's certain musicians who can just play a tune and you go, oh God, it's better now they're playing it, you know. Um, but Miles doesn't want to rest on his laurels and he starts to push forward and he pushes forward by hiring incredible musicians and creating an environment where they do not know what the hell's going on and so they accidentally come up with new things. That seems to be Miles' approach. You know, he, he, he takes orchestral jazz forward with this like Sketches of Spain, you know, Miles Ed stuff with Gil Evans. He, he, did, he pushes the blues forward and modal music with um, uh, kind of blue. He then creates his second great quintet with Herbie Hancock, Tony Williams, Wayne Shaw, Ron Carter. And he, he starts to explore free jazz, but he does it in a very, his own way, um, putting emphasis on the rhythm section above the melody, often keeping the melody straight while the rhythm section improvises. He uh, turns that upside down. He creates this idea of time, no changes, which is probably the most popular form of, sort of free improvisation that exists now. Um, he brings in electric instruments, he then moves towards jazz rock, towards fusion, towards funk, towards afro-funk, he deals with pop music. And for me, he's pioneering, pioneering right to the end, even when he puts out doo-bop and he's working with rappers, right? It might not be his most successful album, but that guy who goes right back to the beginnings of the history of jazz, or at least to the beginnings of bebop, in the early 90s was still exploring new stuff. As Keith Jarrett said, he would rather have a bad band playing bad music than played what he played before. Now, that is um, contradicted because well, towards the end of his life, he did a couple of concerts where he brought everybody back. He did one where he sort of recreated the Gil Evans stuff. This is right before he died. He did another one in Paris where he brought in John McLaughlin and Zaranel and all these players and they went through his catalogue right back to In a Silent Way. He did go back, you know, he had a respect for what he's done, it's obvious, but, but for me, Miles Davis's great importance to jazz was his sound, right? And that the importance of your sound, that the sound is more important than being able to play the changes. And his ability to forge new music forms and do that by... Um, taking great musicians and confusing them so they didn't know what they do. So in other words, he had an ability um, to help musicians access the unconscious. That's a hell of an achievement, Miles. All right. And he's, to me, I think in terms of the musical processes I use as a, as a composer and arrangement, Miles Davis is the most important of all of them. Right. So that's who I have at number four. At number three, I have... Charlie Parker. Charlie Parker didn't invent bebop, right? What Charlie Parker did was he was the sound of bebop. 
Musicians wanted to move music forward. Bebop's a little bit like punk. Um, Bebop is the first music of the second generation. So we have this generation that have come out. They're, they're the children of like King Oliver and Buddy Bolden and Freddie Keppard and Sidney Bechet and Jelly Roll Morton. And those musicians, they've come up and they, they're still making jazz and they hit this world that's been opened up by the original Dixieland Jazz Band. The, the white group that was then recorded and basically put New Orleans on the map, right? So this music starts to come out of New Orleans. I know this is like another contentious idea of mine, but I was reading about this last night. The importance of that original Dixieland jazz group, you know, and in terms of the way they arrange music, arrangement becomes really important, and Jelly Roll Morton and Louis Armstrong start to arrange the music, right? But that generation come through, the Louis, the Dukes, the Camp Bases, they're all born around 1900. Now, the next generation that were born around about 1920 to 1925, they start to come up in the 1940s, and they want to break the rules. They're punks. They want to do something different, and they want to put aside this sort of swingy jazz pop music. They want to create music as like an art form. You know, Charlie Parker's is just Stravinsky and Ravel and all these things. They want to create an art form out of the music. And they start doing experiments in Minton's in the late 30s. You've got Kenny Clark there. You've, uh, you've got Thelonious Monk there. Whole host with Charlie Christian, who need is, is Charlie Christian would be on number 11 on my list. Um, but they don't have the sound. And what Charlie Parker does is what Louis Armstrong does in the in the um, 1920s for jazz. He emerges, and the way he plays becomes the blueprint for everything in bebop, right? He's playing different. Now that sound, if you want to know where it comes from, he comes from Kansas City. Remember we were talking about Camp Basie? And that was that, that had its own world. And one of the things Kansas City players used to do is they would play double time. So rather than bam they go they would play this double time. And 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 Charlie Parker was influenced by that approach, but he had an obsession with the saxophone. This guy was practicing 12 hours a day. And after the famous occurrence where he stepped on stage with uh, Joe Jones and he, he got cut, basically, and he went home, this is, didn't just happen to Charlie Parker. It's happened to us all. You know, as, as a young musician, you get into a situation, you suddenly realise what the real deal is, Right. And it could be all sorts of real deals. I had it when I got the gig with Robert Plant, you know, and I suddenly had to step out in front of 20,000 people and command that stage, and I suddenly realised what a drummer did, you know, and what great drummers do, you know, what makes a Ringo Starr or a John Bonham great, and why those musicians are just as great as Billy Cobham and Nirvana Michael Walden, the guys I grew up with. Um, but with Charlie Parker, he got cut. So he goes home, and he s starts to play through jazz standards using all 12 keys. He's playing in all 12 keys and he starts to use the upper intervals of the chord. So rather than using the, the first third, the fifth, and maybe the seventh to create lines, he is using the ninths, the thirteenths, the sharp um, fours, you know, he starts to get into those notes and that starts to actually bang out the harmony. Now, if you start doing that, you can end up in a great big atonal world. But Charlie Parker got round it, and this is what nobody ever says, with his incredible phrasing. He would target a note, and he would come in from above and below. He would come in like this from above, right? And the way he phrased it, right, which seems to go with his nickname, Bird, he would flit across the top. But he said when he discovered this, it was like um, a mind-warping, you know, sort of um, revelation. And that sound, that sound, that's bebop. That's bebop. He is one of these musicians that not only sound innovates, it's even rarer than that. The way he plays then influences all the instruments. Right? If you're a drummer in the 1920s, 1930s, you are phrasing like Louis Armstrong. If you're a drummer in the 1940s, in Max Roach, Kenny Clark, whoever it is, you're phrasing like Charlie Parker. Everybody is playing like that. And that really now is the way that jazz musicians, musicians play. There's not many musicians out there phrasing like the old, you know, New Orleans musicians anymore 
when players play jazz, they are basically playing Charlie Parker. And that's a shame. That's a shame. When you go back to Charlie Parker, you get this very rare feeling, and there's certain musicians that have this to me, where you feel it's his music. That way of playing is Charlie Parker's. And when you he hear him do it, there's a freedom there that a lot of musicians that try and copy him don't have. It feels like an expression of him personally. There is a freedom to it. And um, there is now on YouTube uh, an interview with, with him, and I think there's a recording of him practicing, and you can just hear the genius in every single note. I, I, I think there's very few jazz musicians, See, I've, I've got serious now, there's very few jazz musicians that um, when you listen to them, it sounds like they just can't go wrong because they are just so inside what they're doing. The famous Loverman recording, where, you know, um, in the late 40s when um, Charlie Parker turns out, you know, he's not in a good state. He's, he's wrecked, basically, by drinking drugs. And he, and he gets through a take of Loverman. Um, a lesser musician, that would have been a horror show. But there is something in that. There is the sound of genius and um, unconscious reaction, musical reaction, that has been honed over years on autopilot going through Lover Man. And it expresses the place he was at. I think at the end of the session, that's the session when he took his saxophone off and threw it through the window of the record studio. Is that right? I think it happens in the, the Clint Eastwood film anyway. So... Um, there's very few music that, that could do that. And so that recording is still loved by Charlie Parker fans. It's not just because of some worship. It's because the guy, it never sounded like a struggle. You listen to someone like John Coltrane, it sounds like a struggle all the time. He sounds like he is pushing, right? But with, with Charlie Parker, there's a playfulness. It's the same playfulness that's in Ornette Coleman. And there's a lot of Charlie Parker in Ornette Coleman, which means there's a lot of Charlie Parker in free jazz. And there's a lot of Charlie Parker in all the antithesis to that sort of jazz college, let's play Charlie Parker licks to the end of time, right? He exists in both, in both worlds. And it's the freedom that I appreciate about Charlie Parker. So that's who I have at number three. So we were now down to the final two. So who do we have at number two? And of course, Duke Ellington, the great composer of jazz, the guy that really is at the forefront of turning this into an art form. Jazz, right, and I have said this on a number of other videos, I don't think jazz's roots are in the black community in America. I think it's in the American community, which contains all sorts of different races, creeds, colours, backgrounds, all sorts of different people. I think uh, black people in America played an incredibly important role in the development of jazz. Like, really, really incredible. But to say it's a black music form denies the fact that it's actually the product of integration. It's the product of integration at a time when America was completely not integrated. So there's a beam of light, there's a beam of hope that's in jazz. That, that within the American dream, the American dream that enslaved the black person, that within that there's also the seeds that can create this incredibly democratic music form. And so in New Orleans, which is a port town, where you've got all these people coming together and there's more freedom, you see all these different music forms, Sicilian music, you see like French music, you see marching band music, polkas, you see like folk music, Irish and Scottish folk music, you see the, 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 the distant memory of African music, but you also see the music that has come out of minstrelsy, you see ragtime, which is another music that's come out of a, you know, the black experience without a doubt. You know, you get rhythms coming from dance music. We get, you know, rhythms coming from Spanish music, Latin American music. All these things are at play, right? But it's basically a street form. Now, who are the people that then came along and took this street form and turned it into an art form? That is your black genius musicians. Which, so if I, and I haven't done this deliberately because you know me, I'm not like this, but if I now look at my list... Every, certain, every person on that list is a black musician. These are the geniuses. Um, these are the musicians denied access to classical music, denied access to the Western European art forms. So they had to make their own art form that was highly 
creative. Now, why, why am I saying all this when it regards to Duke Ellington, right? There are two musicians at the top of this list, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about them at the same time, because I think it would be far more interesting. So, number one, I have, of course, Louis Armstrong. Now, Louis Armstrong is the Charlie Parker of jazz, of the whole of jazz. You know, there's all this brilliant stuff going on. But when Charlie, when, when not Charlie Parker, when Louis Armstrong emerges in the 1920s, he starts to organise jazz in a way that relates to his own sound. He has a way of playing notes. He has a way of playing rhythm. He has a way of featuring soloists and soloists having a role which is not just um, expressing themselves that they have a, have a compositional role in the music you know he, he has he, Louis Armstrong seems to have every single aspect at his fingertips he's a free musician he, do, he uses like rally calls arpeggios classical passages he'll use high screaming notes he'll emulate the sound of a car going past or somebody talking uh, 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 an, an announcer phrase that, uh, that the crowd would say in a in a in a you know, a church which has come from the field hollers, you know, uh, the, the, the slaves um, work songs at the same. All that is just in Louis Armstrong's music. It's not just there. It's in all early jazz, but it's in, in Louis' music. He has a way of organising it, and this becomes the way everybody plays. He's the great musician of jazz. Duke Ellington is something else. Now, Duke Ellington is actually a little bit older than Louis Armstrong. And this is why I'm going to finish this by talking about these two musicians together because it's really interesting because I think it exposes a certain aspect of jazz which doesn't get mentioned. Louis Armstrong is, is growing up in the worst part of New Orleans, right? He's surrounded by brothels and crime. And um, by the time he's, a, you know, in, 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 in coming up to 8, 9, 10, 11, he himself is involved in crime. Now, if you're a black person living in New Orleans, it's not hard to get involved in crime so he lets a gun off shoots a gun off on um you know on, on some festival i can't remember and he gets arrested for it as a young boy and he gets stuck in a waif's home you know he he, he had a mom and stuff but he, he ends up in a waif's home this is a guy at the bottom and uh, the guy at the waif's home for some reason gives him a corner and as soon as he picks this corner out up it's probably the most important that's probably the most important thing that ever happened to 20th century music. When that guy decides to give Louis Armstrong that corny, right? That, if he hadn't done that, then what would have happened, right? Um, now, Duke Ellington, by the other hand, he's coming from a completely different background. This never gets stated, you know. Um, when Louis Armstrong was a boy, he used to go and play baseball. And Theodore Roosevelt, the President of the United States of America, used to come down and watch him play baseball because Duke Ellington became from a highly educated, erudite, upper middle class family and he was educated as a musician. Um, he was offered a scholarship to go and study art. These are two completely different people. Louis Armstrong, for all his genius, he had to, like a street musician, entertain the audience, and he always did. If you go and check out our video, a live show of Louis Armstrong, right, you will be entertained, not just by the music, but by, by all sorts of hokum and fun. All, it's, just a, it's just a joyous experience as he just takes jazz and entertains you. You sit there and go, oh, this is wonderful. This is why he was so popular. Duke Ellington, he has a mission, I think, to move away from that idea of the, the grinning, pleasing, you know, street musician. He wants to create a music which is erudite. He wants to bring in classical influences. He wants to make composition really important. And to do that in jazz, you have a problem because um, in an orchestra, the composer is writing for specific instruments that have a predictable sound. With jazz, you're not, you're dealing with individuals. And so I think his great importance to music was when he was arranging a chord, right? And he's playing, oh, he's got a third, a first, third, and a fifth, right? When he does that, that third's going to be Johnny Hodges, right? It's not just the third, right? He, he, he's, um, you know, that, that fifth's going to be Paul Gonzalez, whoever you speak, you know. Um, that is his genius, to see the sound of the band of, of being the people in that band, right? 
Nowadays, everyone takes that for granted. You know, so someone's producing a record and they say, oh, should we get Jeff Beck in on guitar? You know, not that you can anymore, obviously. When you brought Jeff Beck in, you're, you're, you, what you're doing is you're going you're gonna to use him. Not, it's, it's not that you want guitar on it. You want Jeff Beck on it. That really goes back to these two guys, Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington. And Duke Ellington wanted to raise jazz up to being at the level of, a, of classical music. Now, I have a real problem with this comparison. I don't like it at all. I think it's taken jazz down at a certain snotty, elitist thing. Go, you know, jazz is the great you know, black American art form. It's equivalent to classical music. For me, it denies and diminishes what this music's about. But there is a seriousness there. Now that seriousness actually comes from the French, the hot club of France that was set up in the late 20s to, to, to celebrate as a high art form this incredible music that's coming out of America. And the great hot club of France with Stephen Gopay and Jagger on is the first non-American jazz group to really, really be important. And if you want to know who would be on number 12 on my list, it would probably be Django Reinhardt. Um, that's where this idea that jazz is an art form. Now, this is where people spot it's an art form. But the guy that's within jazz, within inside it, that did more than anybody else is Duke Ellington. The reason why someone like Winter Marsalis is working out the Lincoln, you know, that Lincoln Jazz Center thing that he gets loads of money to do. Um, the reason why he keeps going back to um, Duke Ellington is because of the compositional element. You know, um, Improvisation is ephemeral, but composition isn't. And if you want to celebrate the legacy of jazz composition, which is a massively huge thing, right? It's a huge thing. So we can focus on improvisation and go, which is really important. Jazz gave improvisation to the world. I'm an improvising musician. I can read a bit. But I tend to use these all the time. I've had a career like this. I'm not. I'm not. I'm like a street musician. I learned to play by listening to records, listening to jazz. You know, when I sat on this drum kit here, and I tried to work it out myself. I'm not a school musician, right? Um, um, and um, that doesn't mean I'm not a sophisticated musician. I might be not a sophisticated musician. I'm probably not. But it's not because I came up through that route, and I believe that and that argues against my self-loathing that wants to put myself down because I go well look at Louis Armstrong but Duke wasn't that Duke was, Duke was a properly trained musician that knew exactly what he was doing he come from classical he knew that's why he was had that group um, and Duke is it's the great it's the great orchestra of jazz and when you go back and you listen to something like Moody Indigo, you know, any of those tunes he did, you know, um, you know, Take the A Train or whatever, when you listen to it, you will hear an approach to composition where you could play that in the way Duke played it and there would be no improvisation that everyone is playing what's on the page. And it is 100% jazz. That's really, really important. That's what Duke brings to the music. As an improviser, he's still incredibly important. As we said, he influenced Thelonious Monk, and that's a whole world, right? And the musicians he had in his group was so important to the history of improvisation. But if we look at the top here, we now have a spectrum of jazz, which goes from the individual personality and how a great person with an incredible individual voice operates within jazz and how you structure jazz for that to come out which is why Louis Armstrong always gets given the credit of creating this solo because everyone was just group improvising and just jamming along together he organizes that I think Jenny Ramont did it to us as, as well but Duke um, is doing this and they're both doing the they're, they're the yin to each other's yang but Duke really elevates the compositional aspects of jazz to a high level this is like taking a folk music, a street music, and taking it and pushing it up to a point where it is, is equal to any of the greatest art in terms of the emotional content within that music. That's what um, Duke Ellington does, right? So I'm coming up to the hour on this video. It's been a long video. My throat's starting to hurt. I've been speaking so much. So uh, I'm going to finish up there. So if you enjoyed this video and you liked it, then please like it. The... Um,
most successful video on my YouTube here is about jazz. I started off talking about progressive rock and classic rock, but I'm talking a lot about jazz. So if this video does well, then I will talk more about jazz. So if you enjoyed my take on jazz, and I know I've said some contentious things, and I'm sure people will disagree with what I've said, but that's the whole jazz thing. I've got my point of view, you've got my point, your point of view. We can work together, you know, we can work together and I will change my opinion and my opinion always is changing. Right, so um, if you want to counter what I'm saying, do it in a nice way and I'll have a nice conversation with you. And, and, I, and I might change my mind, it's, you know, we are learning all together. So if you want that to happen, like the video, subscribe and ring the notification bell. Um, if you want to support me in what I'm doing and go deeper in what I'm doing, you can become a patron, the link is down there. And you can go, there's tons of content. We do all sorts, not just like a few extra videos. There's all sorts of different things going on there. And if you want to support me financially, because say if you like this video, go, oh, I'd like to show Andy a bit of love. Then you could go over to my YouTube tip jar, which is also down there and pass on a little bit of money. I have just taken the YouTube tip jar money and spent it on a year's worth of Zoom. Up until now, my Zoom um, interviews were curtailed by the time limit, and I've gone and paid the subscription now. This is what you are doing, so you are now going to see long-form interviews appearing on this, which is something I really wanted to do. Um, tomorrow, I'm interviewing the incredible guitarist Martin Miller. We're going to do a real long one, I think. We're really just talk and let it go. So that's what, that's, that's what you people who have been sticking money in the older YouTube tip job enabled me to do. You know, this is an incredible thing for me. So I thank you all. I thank the gods of jazz. Let's all thank the gods of jazz. Let's thank at number 10, and there's no ranking here, it's a load of rubbish. But let's thank them all, shall we? Shall we thank the gods of jazz? Without these people, we wouldn't, you know, that the, the, they've shown the world so much love. So shall we just show them some love back? So put your hands together and thank the god of, gods of jazz. Thank Thelonious Monk, Coleman Hawkins. Fletcher Henderson, Count Basie, Ornick Coleman, John Coltrane, Miles Davis, Charlie Parker, Duke Ellington, and the King of Jazz, Louis Armstrong.